Six days before Passover, Jesus went to Bethany, the village of Lazarus, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. There they gave a banquet in Jesus' honor, at which Martha served. Lazarus was one of those at the table. Mary bought a pound of costly ointment, pure nard, and, no and anointed the feet of Jesus, wiping them with her hair. The house was full of the scent of the ointment. Judas Iscariot, one of the disciples, the one who was to betray Jesus, protested. Why hasn't this ointment been sold? It could have bought nearly a year's wages and the money been given to poor people. Judas did not say this because he was concerned for poor people, but because he was a thief. He was in charge of the common fund and would help himself to it. So Jesus replied, leave her alone. She did this in preparation for my burial. You have poor people with you always, but you won't always have me. We know the story very well, all four Gospels tell the story about a woman approaching Jesus at a dinner and knowing him. But each Gospel is telling the same story to different communities and different lands. In Matthew, the dinner takes place at Simon the leper's house, and the woman is unnamed. In Luke, the woman has become a woman of ill repute. Who approaches Jesus' feet and washes with her tears and dries them with her hair. And in John, the woman is identified as Mary of Bethany. And he places the story in the home of she and her sister. So in today's reading, Mary and Martha are throwing a dinner party in Jesus' honor. Jesus, this public figure who is advocating and mobilizing people to live out a different social reality. And that different social reality is referred to as the reign of God. And they are so excited because of what Jesus has recently done for their intimate family unit, raising their beloved brother back from the dead. Some of us know people who have come back from dead places. Depression, isolation, no self-worth, dead places, war, abusive relationships, dead places, extreme poverty, innocents incarcerated, profound and unending grief, addiction. Those people grieved and put away in our minds, for we can't imagine them coming back to who they were. We can't imagine them being whole, sitting with us in community like it all never happened. You can understand why they wanted to throw Jesus in this banquet. Yet the text is very understated. We're told almost casually that Lazarus is reclining at the table along with Jesus. And given that he'd been dead and buried only a short while earlier, this portrait of him sitting at the table and eating is pretty stark. I mean, we don't linger at all here in the text over the fact that this recently deceased man is now back in circulation. Nobody asked him about a near-death experience, asking him, so what did you see? Any bright lights? Did you bump into Moses? Or anybody that we know? Instead, the focus of the scene quickly shifts to Mary and to her anointing of Jesus' feet with a highly expensive and fragrant perfume. I can imagine her overwhelming gratitude for having her brother return to her, for restoring her brother back to life. But here's the thing, in that time and place, it was taboo for a man to be touched by a woman. Still more, a woman's loose hair was perceived as being a very sensual thing. 
it's still true today. In fact, in the East, in the Quran, it says, lower your gaze and be modest. Specifically, it says, say to the believing men that they should lower their gaze and guard their modesty. That will make it pure, uh, greater purity for them. And God is well acquainted with all and what they do. And say to the believing women that they should lower their gaze and guard their modesty. That they should not display their beauty and ornaments. They should draw their veils over their chest and not display their beauty except for their husbands. So you have to understand what a scandalous act this was. This is a very intimate act. This is something that you would only do in the bedroom. And this intimate act is performed by the same Mary who sat at Jesus' feet to study. Every detail of this story breaks the social boundaries of the day. And on top of it all, this dinner to honor Jesus ends with bitterness and arguments. This is outrageous. This woman is beside Jesus. She's too close to him. She's touching him. She lets down her hair. Then she caresses his feet with this oil. And even in our culture, touching someone's feet is not done outside the bedroom unless you're getting a pet <laughs> For her to be so familiar is astounding and it's embarrassing. And it's uncomfortable, not just for those who witness this, but even those who hear about it, even those who would read about this. She's shameless. And she steps far outside the bounds of convention, teetering on the edge of total scandal. Her actions are laced with a wanton tenderness found between married couples, not an unmarried man and woman. And even for Jesus, who regularly steps outside social mores regarding women of his time, the fact that he allows her to do this is also astonishing. But you know what, for me, what I like about this text is that it spits directly in the face of the image of the seductive Eve. You know, Eve in Genesis who tempts Adam with what is forbidden, and together they are evicted from the Garden of Eden and her biological femaleness is seen as a curse. But now here in this story, we have a woman being seductive and using her femaleness, her sensuality as a gift, going against every religious image of what feminine devotion looks like and daring to be the one in this scandalous act to be the one who anoints Jesus to proclaim by her actions this is our king. This Mary embodies what giving yourself completely might look like. It is emotional. It is wonderfully fragrant and it is stirring. Mary anoints Jesus with perfume and as Judas finally notes, it is a costly gift. According to Mark, the perfume price was 300 denarii, nearly a yearly salary, but Mary doesn't care. But you know, some of us know that there are always people who sneer at anything that smacks of being extravagant, whatever the cause. <clears throat> you know, Judas has followed Jesus because that's where the action is. Yes, he has heard the gospel every day from Christ's own lips, but he's not satisfied. 
he's invested a lot of time following this, this Jesus guy around. He believes he's the Messiah and he wants a piece of the action. You know, so many people do this. They follow around people of large reputation because they love to live in the reflected light of others' celebrity and good deeds. That person becomes the star that makes them shine. And here is Judas, basking in the reflected light of Jesus, following him, but wondering, when are he and the disciples going to be in the seat of power? I mean, when are they going to kick some Roman behind? What's in it for them? Where are the goodies? When will the kingdom of God start generating a cash flow? I think he's tired of waiting. And now he's uncomfortable and embarrassed. I think when this was going on, he probably can't even look. I think he's uncomfortable with seeing that level of devotion and intimacy that is usually hidden. But to be fair to him, if I was in that room, I don't know if I could have looked either. I mean, it would have moved me deeply because I recognize the deep love and devotion and, and the complete abandon that's being expressed. But I think seeing it would have put me off a little bit. And I think part of my uncomfortableness would be, I'm not sure if I could express my love and devotion in such a public way, even though I know I'm called to do that. I mean, what does it look like to love somebody and hold nothing back? What does it mean to say that we love Jesus that much that we would hold back absolutely nothing? But here I see Judas' condemnation as a projection of his discomfort and perhaps a measure of his lack of love for Jesus. He is repelled by this show of profound gratitude and extravagant intimacy because that's not where his heart really is. His response, why wasn't this perfume sold for a year's wages and the money given to the poor? Now at first, this might seem like a sensible response. But in the text, John makes it clear that Judas' question is not born out of concern for the poor. In the text, it says, he says this because he was a thief. And he kept the money that they collected for ministry, and he was stealing from it. Judas is uncomfortable with Mary's di display of devotion. And when I think about her doing this in front of everybody, knowing the scandal that it would cause, and not caring, it reminds me of Billie Holiday's song, Ain't Nobody's Business If I Do. <laughs> you know that song? Yes. There ain't nothing I can do, nothing I can say that people won't criticize me, but I'm gonna do what I want to anyway. And I don't care what people say. Amen. <laughs> Mary has a reputation. She has a notion that Jesus is the Messiah. And in the words of the song, if she gets a notion to jump into the ocean, if she gets a notion to pour perfume on his feet and wipe it up with her hair, ain't nobody's business if I do. 
Mary has a notion to demonstrate her love and devotion, where Mary gives Judas hoards, where Mary sacrifices financially, Judas seeks self-benefit. And yet, what Judas criticizes as waste is in fact the greatest gift that Mary can give. Not expensive perfume or money, but the offering of her life, stripped of all convention, stripped of all self-consciousness, oblivious to what other people think, oblivious to what other people say, preferring to lavish what is most precious in service of the one who serves and blesses and restores us and those we love. What I like about this is this is not an intellectual affirmation. This is a in your space, in your face, in the pit of your being proclamation. So what about us? When we proclaim our faith, when we tell people who we follow and what we believe, can we overcome what other people think? I mean, can we truly display a profound intimacy with what is holy and not be afraid to be embarrassed? Can we dare to let our hair down and open our hearts to the experience of what is holy? I hope the answer is yes. Because when we do, when we're able to get so very close to Emmanuel, God with us, when we do, we will forget ourselves in that moment. When we break the seal of our hearts, when we speak through our actions and pour out our sincere affection, it smells like love. The aroma of mercy, the fragrance of faith, and it will not only fill a room, it could fill the whole world. But Judas, is witnessing this and his disappointment turns to resentment, then festers into something diabolical. And he sells himself for the very money that he's criticizing her for wasting. I think one of the less intentions will be misunderstood and even resisted by people that are so very close to you. But as the poem by Mother Teresa says, do good anyway. If you were kind, people will accuse you of being selfish. Be kind anyway. Give the best you have and it will never be enough. As she says, give your best anyway. If we read further to verses 9 and 10, it says, when the great crowds learned that Jesus was there at the banquet, they came to see Lazarus. That little side note, the one who had come back from the dead. The word had gotten out. Somebody had been restored and was back with their family. When the word got out about the dinner party, they came to see Lazarus. And then the text says, so the chief priests planned to put Lazarus to death because so many were leaving the synagogue and believing in Jesus. And here we get a glimpse of the larger social dynamics of death and how returning from those dead places is a threat to those who have oppressed and colonized people. Because when you choose whom you honor and how you honor them, it can 
mess up the social reality of those around you. If you bring back people from death, you reverse injustice. You reverse self-hatred. You reverse addiction. You stand tall in the face of the illusion of power and the presence of might. When you bring people back from death, it upsets the status quo. And so we are here. Jesus anointed as would a high priest or king by Mary in keeping with Jewish tradition. And Judas criticizing and scheming and the powers to be upset and ready to strike. And next week, the people respond. And this divine drama heats up. Go in peace.